Make this Christmas memorable with Goat Guns. Get the coolest miniature gun models for your collection. From historical classics to modern weapons, we have something for every firearm and hobby enthusiast. Surprise your loved ones with the gift of Goat Guns, the perfect blend of quality and detail. Shop now and spread the joy at GoatGuns.com. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with David Garcia about virtual onboarding, culture building, and the challenges of remote work environments. David Garcia, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Really glad to be here today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm super excited for this conversation. We're going to be talking about all things related to remote work and the the opportunities, but also really the challenges of that. And among the challenges, there's lots of things we can talk about, but we're going to focus in on things like virtual onboarding, culture building, and other related things, you know, because there's many of these components that we, when we're together in person, they can kind of just happen. Sometimes they happen organically. And when you're working virtually or in a remote kind of an environment, or even a hybrid environment, sometimes these things can be a little bit more challenging. So we're going to try to unpack that and better understand what we might be able to do if that's how we're running our workplace. If we have remote workers, if we have a hybrid environment, what do we need to do to make sure we have successful uh, onboarding practices that we really can develop, maintain, and sustain a, a healthy, dynamic workplace culture, uh, just so we can have a thriving team. As we get started, I wanted to share David's bio with everybody. David Garcia is the CEO of Scout Logic, a pre employment background check company. He is an experienced data industry executive with more than 25 years of proven success in securing and increasing revenue from new and incumbent customers while delivering superior client satisfaction. David possesses strong business acumen and has applied a wide range of client development strategies to establish market presence and increase revenue. David previously held senior sales and marketing roles with First Advantage, IRI, and GSI US. David holds an AB in political science from the University of Michigan. Uh, So wonderful. Anything else about yourself that you'd like to share with listeners by way of your background before we dive on in? I'm a mediocre tennis player, John, but I think after that long list, uh, I think you've got it all. Yes, I share my mediocrity in tennis. <laughs> I, I, I'm the same. I'm I'm mediocre in all sports, yet I still like to play them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, very good. Very good. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, what you've experienced over this last couple of years. Because as we talk about remote work, online, uh, even hybrid work, you know, this is something that existed pre-pandemic clearly. Uh, And there are some organizations that were completely remote prior to the pandemic, but most companies hadn't really gone there and they had to really grapple with it, you know? And so now we were two years in to this thing where we've had this grand experiment. What has been your experience in your company? And then we can start to dive on into like what's gone well, what hasn't gone so well and some of the challenges. Terrific. So, you know, obviously everyone got got forced into remote work for the most part with the start of the pandemic. But Scout Logic, we were founded in 2017 and we actually had an initially envisioned like having kind of the classic, like cool office environment, ping pong tables, you know, the beanbag chairs, people are going to want to hang out and work there all day. And what we learned really quickly was that for our business, like so many people is the differentiator. And if you limit sourcing talent to the 10, 20, 30 mile radius from that office, you're missing out on potentially great people for your company. So when we started scaling up in mid to mid to the end of 2017, 
you know, we were able to kind of cobble together what a remote work environment would look like and started sourcing talent from all over the United States and eventually globally to work on Scout Logic. And that has been <clears throat> an absolute game changer for us, not only in terms of the great experience our clients get because we've got great people, but, you know, when you heard people talk about, gosh, talent shortages, you know, because of that, that viewpoint and that wide aperture we take, we've been able to consistently find great people to work, work with Scout Logic to deliver for our clients. Yeah, that's awesome. So you went there before everyone was forced to go there. Sometimes that, you get lucky, John. <laughs> and that, that's wonderful though, because that, did, that yeah. means you did kind of figure out some of this before everyone else kind of had to figure out how to turn on a dime, right? Yeah. And, and go from uh, you know physical office space to, to virtual workforce almost overnight. Um, now, clearly there are challenges with this, but you just highlighted perhaps one of the biggest advantages and that is you break down these artificial geographical barriers to talent. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's the way the world has worked for forever. Like if you want people to work for your company, they, you know, for most companies, 99% of people work where they lived. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's benefits to that. And we're going to talk about some of those benefits and some of the related challenges to not having that. But when you're really struggling to get good people, especially technology, you know, STEM related people with all these skills, that's a challenging thing. And if you're not lucky enough to be in a big metropolitan area, um, you know, you could really be hurting. And even when you're in a, a metropolitan area, you're competing with all the other companies for the same talent. Absolutely. So, so now you break down those artificial geographical barriers, you open yourself up to hiring anyone with the skill set, with the talent that you need. And boom, you're good to go, right? And it, so it seems like a no-brainer, yet even though we're two years into this experiment and in most organizations, I think have largely figured out how, how to do it at least semi-effectively, mm -hmm. many companies, many leaders are really, really pushing hard to move back to the office, um, perhaps in a hybrid model, but you know, largely an in-person model, which means the geographical barriers are gonna go back up for those organizations. And I have to admit that one alone especially amidst the great resignation and everything, that one alone befuddles me. I, I don't understand how leaders think they're going to be able to get away with that. It, it does for me as well. And I, I sit on the boards of a few companies and you know, we have a lot of discussions about what, what an in-office experience should look like. Those companies are more progressive and you know, they view it as an opportunity for collaboration. It doesn't need to be like 100%. There can be flexibility. But then when you see some of the press like, we will all be back wearing ties within 90 days, to me, that's trust. That is the management of that company does not trust their employees to deliver like they probably have been since this pandemic started. And it's no wonder so many, so many employees are leaving and, and we're experiencing this great resignation. Well, yeah, and that's one of the other big benefits of remote work not only do you break down the artificial geographical barriers, but now you provide the flexibility for people. Uh, so they don't have to have these big, long, nasty commutes. If you're, if you're working oh, in Silicon Valley, you know, and you have to, you can't afford to live there. So you're commuting two hours each way. And I mean, that's crazy. And so you have, you know, I, I, I was talking to a guy recently who moved to Lake Tahoe, you know, he yeah. works downtown San Francisco. Um, and now he moved to Tahoe because he's just able to do it remotely. And the quality of his life has like gone skyrocketed. Right. And, and, and now companies are saying, nope, you got to come back. You got to commute three, four hours a day <laughs> and it's not going to work. No. And it's, it's one of the silver linings of the pandemic. I think for many companies, you know, our engagement scores, when we use culture amp, you know, they're like 96, which is off the charts, right? Um, our retention is almost a hundred percent, which is very rare these days. Much of it is due to the culture we like to foster at Scout Logic, but I think much of it is the fact that, you know, we've been supportive of a remote work environment. I, I do a one-on-one -on -one check in with everyone in our company at least twice a year. And a consistent theme from all our folks is, hey, taking the two hour commute away means, you know, I still work really hard, David. I'm like, of course, but like I get two hours to do what I love with who I love, right? And, and these people are happier, I, I think, when they get that type of time back, John. 
Well, and it's, it, it's also just a matter of having flexibility of when you work. Some people totally. are really like wake up at four in the morning and work. Other people are, you know, kind of night owls or whatever. Or some people just want to break up their day. And they're, they're more effective that way. Or maybe they have kids at home. And so they want to be able to go to the school play or go pick their kids up from school, help them with homework. Like it, there's really simple little things like that. When you just provide totally. the flexibility, people eat it up. Well, and Johnny, it's so funny you mentioned that, you know, because obviously we recruit salespeople as well. And whenever uh, we're recruiting a seller who mentions that they have a family, I'm like, how often do you get to go to your kids' sports practices? And they're like, well, you know, during, you know, if I have to be the office, I never, I never can go. And I'm like, well, tell you what, you're making your number, you're getting up early, you should go to every practice, you should go to every game, right? I mean, that that is a, a benefit that spans, you know, beats compensation all day long, right? Yeah, it absolutely is. So that flexibility piece is huge for yep. employees. Uh, the, the, the breaking down geographical barriers is huge for employers. Uh, and, and you know, of course, there's just physical space costs and you know, those types of fixed costs that you get to eliminate when you're not having everyone come together uh, in, a, in a physical office space. But it's not all roses either. It's, it's challenging. Yeah. To, to run a remote team effectively. And, and again, some organizations have figured it out and have done it quite well. Others have really struggled and have either gone away or they're the ones that have struggled so much. That's why they're telling everyone, you just got to come back because we don't know how to do this. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, a couple of those challenges, and, and there are many, but, but we can focus at least for now on, on onboarding. So you hire great people. They could be from anywhere, distributed across yeah. the world. You got to onboard them though. And then you want to create, you want to build and sustain a really healthy dynamic culture, yeah. but you're not together in the same physical space that can be challenging. So what, yeah. are, what are some of the things that you've done at Scout Logic to try to, to do that effectively? It, well, let's, and we're, we're going to break it apart for this and just like some tactical stuff that we have learned that I never thought I would care about. And then some more soft, how we build culture on the tactical piece, like our HR leadership they become logistics managers and shipping. So think about all the stuff like an employee typically gets on their first day of work, right? A computer, like the swag, the welcome day lunch, like all of those activities have had to move <laughs> virtual. And, and we really needed to map out what does our onboarding process look like physically. And now what does it look like virtually? And we have to think about, do we have enough lead time to source the computer to get it shipped to somebody's house? Do they get the welcome packet at the house? Do they have a buddy assigned? Do we have a virtual lunch assigned that day? So the logistical planning and creating a virtual onboarding experience that mimics or is hopefully better than what someone's done historically, as an HR leader and as a CEO, you really have to think about that. So that first impression that an employee gets is what you want to start to maximize engagement from the get-go. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy. Courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Yeah, and let's let's not forget, like we, we may take it for granted and in the past you know, I, I suppose it makes sense because people got hired. They would actually show up to work. Um, <laughs> but, but now that's not necessarily something you can take for granted. There's, there's 
tons of stories about people just getting completely ghosted. You make an offer, the person never shows totally. up, right? Or they show up for a day, a week, and they're like, yeah. eh, uh, this doesn't work for me. And so, yeah. so the onboarding process in many organizations, even in a face-to-face environment in the past, you know, I, I think many organizations didn't fully leverage that opportunity. And it was really more of this, you know, just kind of the checking the box, make sure, did they get their employee manual? Did they sign yeah. these documents? Did they, yeah. you know, did they fill out their, their tax form? You know, like those sorts of things. And and really was uh, missing the boat on, in terms of connecting them and embedding oh, them right. into the organization. Right. And what you're describing now is that's part of what you have to think about remotely, how to make sure that you're doing it. Because again, if someone feels like they've been ignored, they, they, you know, it, it's a, it's a talent market out there right now. People have choices and, and, you know, if I'm going to a company, I'm excited. And then I show up and it seems like they're aloof. They, they're not prepared. They, they really don't seem yeah. to care enough to, to integrate me. Yep. Yeah, that might be enough just for me to take the next offer. Right. And so totally. we need to make sure that our onboarding is really, really solid. Now, this is something yeah. I would have said to anyone five years ago, but right now, you know, I'm, I, I would say it even more fervently because you, uh, man, the, the, the difficulty organizations are having to attract and retain great people is, yeah. is, 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 is high as it's ever been. And the, the onboarding is just one of those low hanging fruit things that you need to do well. And if you're not doing yeah. it well, you're really in trouble. Absolutely. And all the <clears throat> hard work and logistics that go into that need to be meticulously mapped out and executed upon to make sure that person has a great experience. Yeah. And, and let me say, we're talking about the challenges of doing remote onboarding and it, that yeah. is a challenge. Again, I'll just repeat though, most organizations in my experience we're really crummy. Totally. We're really crummy at doing onboarding, even, <laughs> even in person. So, I mean, this is something we just need to pay much more attention to. And if, if, if we're really thoughtful about it, and like you said, meticulous with the details so that people don't fall through the cracks and the important things, like if, if someone shows up to work and they can't do anything because they don't have the equipment or they don't have the logins or they like some of those basic things, yep. oh my gosh, that you're going to turn people off so quickly. So absolutely. Well, good. So let's talk now a little bit more about culture. Uh, That, of course, also is a really challenging thing in any organizational setting. And most companies, you know, grapple with this, whether you're in-person, remote, hybrid, or whatever. Um, Within a remote team, though, you know, and distributed across time zones, perhaps across the world, uh, a richness of diversity, it's a great opportunity, but it's a challenge. So what are some of the things that you tried to do? So we do, we have like essentially a top down and a bottoms up approach piece on the top up. It's all kind of the classical strategies and tactics you would use. You know, we have defined culture statements. Um, Every two weeks, we get the entire company together virtually for an hour session to not only talk about the business, but also reinforce our culture and examples of great leadership within the company from all levels, embracing that culture. Um, and in all of our, you know, measurements and performance evaluations, we bake in cultural values and obviously part of that onboarding organization. But where the rubber really meets the road in a remote environment are the people that that employee is engaging with day in and day out. And so we assign virtual buddies to employees. We make sure everybody has a daily stand up within our company where they're talking about you know, cultural values and demonstrating and recognizing each other for that. You've got to make sure it's happening organically at all levels of the business if you really want it to take root. And then on the flip side of that, obviously one of the biggest destroyers of culture can be unhealthy conflict. Um, if I if I can leave your listeners uh, with one thing, it is uh, we call it our three email rule at Scout Logic. If, if there have been three emails on a topic, the next communication needs to be a Zoom video call or Google Hangouts, whatever your tool is, because that's when problems start. <laughs> that's when feelings get hurt. People get uh, their ideas misconstrued. People go to bed angry at night. It's the three email rule and we're done. Then we get on the phone and I get, I I get held accountable to that all the time by my people because I just want to fire off stuff when I'm stressed. 
and people will say, no, Dave, we got to get, we got to get on a zoom call and talk to each other. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's a, I, I've never heard that articulated that way. Uh, makes a whole lot of sense. And I know some people I get, I, frankly, I get frustrated because I love email. I think it's super totally. efficient, super efficient. And I'm, I'm probably of the same mind as you. I'm like, I'm just going to fire stuff off to people and I'm going to move forward. And if they have questions, email me back. And then there's a documented trail and blah, blah, blah. Yep. Right. And I know people who don't, they hate email. Like they, they want to do a call um, always. And I'm yep. like, ah, oh, let's start with email first, you know? And, and what, what I like about what you just said though, is it really kind of is a nice compromise um, for both kind of approaches, both styles. And you're absolutely right. So much can get lost so quickly in email mm-hmm. exchanges if you're not yep. careful. So, so yep. I love that. I love that. So there's, you know, you, w- one of the things you said in, in your, your last response was really in my mind, just how you're embedding culture mm-hmm into the organization in a lot of very specific ways. You're creating mechanisms for culture, (laughs) Um, integration and sustainability. And that's what we need to think about because so many organizations have the the mission statement, the value statement, they have, uh, you know, they'll even put it in the onboarding process. They might even integrate it into the performance management process. It might be something that is verbally said repeatedly. And that's, you know, if you're doing that, that's, you're probably in the top 20% of all organizations because most organizations aren't even doing those things, but yeah. saying all the right things isn't enough either. Like you have to, Absolutely. you have to get past that, right? You need to really integrate it and you have to create the mechanisms. And so the buddy uh, approach, like you said, having, having the check-ins, having the opportunities for both organic and systematic culture building and sustainability is really important. Are, are there any other um, elements that you've seen that have been challenging in terms of that culture in the remote kind of an environment? You know, it, it's so interesting. We, we talk about this as a leadership uh, team all the time, John, and it's really about you know, when we get a new person in um, that if they don't quite fit our model or if they haven't gotten off to a great start, making sure that we wrap around them so they're not ostracized from people, right? When you're in a physical office, I know this sounds so kindergarten, but when you're in a physical office, it's very hard to not only hide from people, but to be invisible, even though it can still happen. Well, in a remote world, it's very easy to be invisible. And and as a a leadership team, we're always worried when we hear about, oh, so-and-so, I don't really know them. I don't talk to them. You know, they've been here three months. I think they're doing okay. Those are massive watch outs for us. And that's when we get on our managers and their peers to make sure we're engaging with those people. So A, that they're a great fit for us, but we're living up to our commitment to them culturally as well. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. Uh, So again, challenges with culture, challenges with things like onboarding, but it's definitely doable. And, you know, I, I really do think that these are challenges that every organization face and so to fall back on, you know, it's, it's hard to do it remotely. So we, it's just an excuse to make sure everyone comes into the office. Now we have to be physically proximate to each other. You know, yeah. I, I think that's just missing the boat. Uh, and it's, it's, failing to, it's failing to acknowledge the fact that this is a challenge in every organization, in any context, in any setting. Uh, so rather than just, you know, in a sense, throw the baby out with the bathwater, the good things about, you know, remote, flexible, hybrid approaches mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, rather than acknowledging that and, and trying to, to leverage those benefits and then to, to, to address the challenges, you know, too many organizations are just saying, let's, let's come back to the physical workspace. Uh, another yeah. one of those, and you mentioned it a few minutes ago, but another one of those pieces is collaboration. So some people yeah. are just of the mind, it's, it's impossible to collaborate effectively when we're not physically together. Uh, thoughts on that? Thoughts on how to collaborate effectively in a remote environment? So I'll just, I'll use myself as an example. Um, you know, my, my background, as you shared, is more commercial, but our business obviously has a massive operational component to how we deliver. So my chief operating officer, Carrie Schneider, is critical uh, to our organization, really. And, and it's how we win in market. So I, I need to be in lockstep with Carrie, not just on you know, collaboration and innovation, but just on the day-to-day business. I haven't seen Carrie in person in two and a half years. He lives in Cleveland. I live in Chicago. So it's like, it's not hard. Um, 
but it is kind of observing all of those basic rules of, you know, when we're talking about things more strategically or things that can have more conflict between the two of us, it has to be over some sort of video mechanism. We have to see each other's faces uh, in order to really make sure we can foster that. And the technology is absolutely there. Is it still fun to get together in person? Of course. Uh, as soon as we all feel comfortable, and that should be very soon, I hope, John, we're going to do that. But, you know, our businesses had triple digit growth each year during the pandemic. You can make it work if you embrace some of those basic communication principles. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, David, it's been a real pleasure. I note the time. I'm going to have to let you go here in just a couple minutes. But before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about uh, your work, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, terrific. So, uh, so John, thank you again for having me. Uh, feel free, uh, any listeners, to reach out to me at david.garcia at scoutlogicscreening.com. Always happy to share best practices and ideas on how to great create great employee engagement. And if you ever have a background screening need as well, our mission is to make background checks easy for recruiters. Always happy uh, to help people out. And I think just the last, the last word I'm going to leave on remote is I'm going to go back to my three email rule. Make sure you're pushing everybody in your organization to get on the phone and see each other's faces because otherwise, you know, we get, we get stuck behind that wall of email and that's not healthy for anybody, uh, even introverts like me. So thanks again, John, for having us on today. Yeah. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what David and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer than Indigo Leadership, the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think.
Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.